Welcome to my YouTube channel, everybody. I'm Dr. Angel Storm. I'm so excited to be here with you today and a very special guest. Marcus Akers is going to be joining me to talk about his experience being in ministry and experiencing spiritual abuse. Typically, when we talk about spiritual abuse, we're talking about congregants or members of a religious organization suffering from the leadership structure. But in this case, it's actually the leadership structure that is spiritually abusive and was manipulating and controlling Marcus as an employee of that structure. And I'm doing this interview really just to give you another perspective. I think it's very important that we understand this comes in all shapes and sizes. It can happen to anybody. And just because you have one view or one pers perspective on how this abuse comes across doesn't mean that that's encompassing everybody else's experience. So I just want to introduce Marcus really quick. He has been in the ministry for over 28 years. He has been on ministry boards. He served as uh, a, a pastor at the Upper Room Church Ministries, and you might know that church from the podcast that I do with his brother Justin every month. He's also been a missionary overseas, and he loves the Lord, and I really want to get your perspective, Marcus, today on the experience, good and bad, that you have had sure. on this journey of you know, being obedient, serving the Lord in many different areas of life and different positions and so forth, and how this has, you know, evolved and shaped who you are today, who how you uh, do ministry today, which we're going to get to at the very end. But first of all, um, I would love for you to just share your perspective and your journey into ministry from the very beginning, even prior to um what we're about to talk about with your specific experience dealing with spiritual abuse. But when you, you obviously come from a line of, yes. of ministers. And so if you can mm -hmm. kind of talk about how your, your calling came about and how mm -hmm. this happened for you, that would be great for, Thank to give my viewers some, some context. Sure thing. And uh, Angela is so nice to be with you today. And I appreciate the invitation to be on your podcast. Oh, thank you for um, joining me. Well, you know, so I'm I'm third generation li licensed and ordained minister. My yeah. uh, grandfather on my father's side uh, was a Baptist minister across Arkansas, established over 32 churches. Uh, my father, uh, you know, established this this ministry, and and I became a licensed and ordained minister <clears throat> in the uh, late 90s. But before that, I can remember my family uh, having just a sincere uh, pursuit of God and over uh, in our home and so forth. And being raised in that environment where my family was seeking the will of God, uh, challenged uh, to have God's provision uh, in our lives. Uh, and the first time, so they kept us in church services where, where the presence of the Lord was there, the Spirit of the Lord was moving. And I can remember at the age of five, the first time that the Lord actually spoke to me during a service. And uh, I brought that word to my father and he took me to the pastor and uh, and the pastor, you know, clarified that, yeah, that was a word from the Lord. So that the Lord's my passion for God has always been a part of my life. And I believe a lot of it came from how my parents raised us. But uh, whenever I was uh, about 1994, uh, I was seeking the Lord. The Lord was calling me into ministry, full-time ministry. And I was in a worship service uh, with a few hundred people with hands raised and just embracing God and God embracing me. And I remember God speaking to me, create an atmosphere for my presence and I will do miracles. And so my uh, calling has always been, regardless of pastor or any form of missions uh, or even in academia, I've always sought to not control uh, an environment, but but to uh, build an atmosphere that invites the Holy Spirit and then allows Him to move in people's lives. Mm. Wow, that is so beautiful. And especially today where that is just so needed, right? A refuge, a place of safety, a place of peace, yes. a place of harmony. And so, you know, your journey 
um, started very young, and you eventually did become the pastor of the Upper Room Church, where mm-hmm. your brother Justin is now the pastor after your father uh, went to be with Jesus full time. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And then from there, you felt God call you into another area of ministry. Can you discuss how that happened? Sure. And, you know, and to, and to go back to a little bit to the ministry side when I was growing up, that was difficult being raised as a pastor's uh, a child in, 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 a, in a home. Okay. T- t- Very, t- talk, talk about that. I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, especially for your viewers that are... Um, you know, looking at uh, uh, abuse that does happen, you know, yeah. with uh, it, it's so hard on pastor's children because they, they're the pastor themselves is judged on how the children act. Sure. So it's like a constant resume, you know, it's con- a constant <laughs> uh, interview. And when you're yeah. 10 or 12 or 15 years old, uh, and so one, one time uh, I, w- I was told that a pastor cannot pastor of church if he can't lead his family. And so uh, children are, are, are the pastor's children are just constantly either baited to get close to the parents mm. uh, or so they're always manipulated people will manipulate the children through gifts mm. money so forth oh, wow. uh, to have influence in the home wow. but they're just they just treat kids as pawns they did that with us as, as children they would favor us uh, just to get close to our, our parents uh, so it, it, it is a challenge and it, it truly drove me away from the Lord for a few for a few years Wow, that's so interesting. And so so even prior to that's an interesting twist on spiritual abuse of the congregants using mm-hmm. the the children in mm-hmm. a way to try to manipulate their way to get close to the mm-hmm. pastor and his wife or the leadership mm-hmm. and and you know their spouse in in a situation. Very interesting. That mm-hmm. is definitely very, very... another topic <laughs> for a different podcast because <laughs> yes. that it brings out a whole other <laughs> realm of things that I never even considered to be honest. Well, it's very it's it's challenging. Uh, you know when you when you. Uh, look at ministry overall uh, abuse or manipulation or control are all aspects of human nature mm-hmm. uh, that follow the fallen nature yeah and from that point it does manifest in different ways i i chose whenever i went into leadership i made a vow to god uh, because i saw i was a chaplain at old roberts university and mm. and i saw that my words were having impact on people's lives they were actually doing what i was saying <laughs> <laughs> and that 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 scared me and mm. uh, so I made a vow to God, and I went to Scripture, and I said, "Well, God, how do you deal with us?" And and so God never controls, and He never manipulates, right. which is the at which is the absence of relationship. But what He does is He leads and He influences. So I made a choice. I would never give over to uh, manipulation and control. I I would always lead and influence uh, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Oh wow! Well, that that experiencing what you did as a child I mean it makes sense for you to be aware then at the point where you can see how powerful your words are impacting others and thinking probably back to your own childhood of when adults words were impacting you only unbeknownst to you it was to manipulate you know to kind of use you in, in a way to get to your parents and to have favor with them and influence in the church and so forth so that makes a lot of sense how that comes full circle and actually i think that's a great example to bring in later on when we talk about mm-hmm the healing process and and um you know how experiencing spiritual abuse in a leadership structure has actually changed you and the way that you approach ministry and so forth so um so after you after you moved from the upper room church you want to talk a little bit about um wh- what you got into and how you tr- kind of transitioned although it's still a form of ministry but you actually transitioned away from being a pastor and into academia yes uh, when i moved into academia uh became uh, working at a very large e- evangelical online school uh, with a residential component i was part of the online uh program and and that uh, in the school of uh, government, and so we were growing it. God's always used me in a transitional way. Uh, so when He, God's always l- placed me in ministries that were in a transition of growth. So a time of vulnerability. Gro- growth is a time of vulnerability, and you have to have people, leaders of integrity, 
to shepherd that growth, and then it will solidify and take its form. But uh, growth does does bring a lot of of attack. It, you know, uh, it is a, again a, a vulnerable season, and so the Lord transitioned me into academia uh, to, I believe, uh, uh, ensure success uh, uh, in this particular school, and because the mission uh, is it, to raise up. Uh, students with a Christ-centered worldview, and so God allowed us to to do just that. Well, when I became a part of that institution, I realized that there was a pervasive uh, culture of fear, and at first I didn't understand it, but um, but then I began uh, I, I began to see that it was a, just a control structure. Uh, that some of the administration were using uh, to uh, to ensure their own their own success uh, uh, in that institution, and uh, so anyone that was not aligned uh, with their agenda, they would use they would use uh, control and fear uh, uh, to shape them to conform them to what they wanted, and instead of the mission and, and being led by the Holy Spirit. So it was definitely a, an environment that was conducive for abuse. Yeah, yeah. And like so many times when you're dealing with a narcissist, it's not straight away in your face. You know, it's not like, hey, I'm an abuser and I'm going to abuse you, right? It's that slow (laughs) revealing of the true nature, right? Because otherwise they would not have any victims. They wouldn't have any sources of uh, supply for manipulation Mm -hmm. and uh, to exert their control, their fear, their agenda over. And um, and in this case is exactly what you're saying. You're saying, hey, I felt called to go do that. But then mm-hmm. as, I, as you were in that environment, you started to see the true nature of what was happening in the leadership structure of mm-hmm. using fear to further their own agenda, which mm-hmm. in this situation, what do you think their agenda really was? Well, the agenda, I think uh, anytime that someone uses control or manipulation, they're they're viewing, uh, they're not valuing the individual that 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 they're in partnership with. So that is no longer an individual that has a purpose and a and a soul and a destiny by God. You know, they don't view that individual as a sovereign individual. Yes, uh, that's just a resource. Uh, it's just a resource to to gain strength and power. Uh, and typically it's boiled down to the power of the dollar and uh, right. just yeah so that is kind of what uh, and it's a, it's it's politics on some level but when you work for an academic institution as in any institution uh, how much of the territory you control uh, by your influence is is how much wealth you're able to gain and so when you have an institution that has uh, 15, 16 departments, uh, you could literally see, pe- peg off and say, okay, how many of these departments are aligned with me, has, are loyal to me, not, not, not the vision uh, of the institution, not the, God, the God-breathed authority, but to me as a person, an individual, because it's, it, the more uh, departments that are aligned, leaders in that institution are aligned with a particular leader or structure allows the financial power they can govern over more of the assets and so that that really was the goal it's uh similar to chess you know when you're moving moving the game of chess it's very manipulative it's you're beating your opponent with the mind but also there's an asian uh strategy game called go and go is Mm -hmm. about territory taking territory and so i think that was more of their uh, strategy take territory by putting individuals of uh, uh, loyal to, to them. It sounds a lot like uh, the way autocratic governments work in, in the world today, such as Vladimir Putin or, or Xi Jinping. It's, mm-hmm. it, they, they, they don't put the most qualified people over the institutions uh, are around them. They put people that are loyal to them around those because that, that secures their power over the country. And, and so, that, it's a, so it's a, a, a game that is uh, played but at the end of the day, a lot of innocent people, good people, uh, get caught up into a very abusive structure. You, it's either you have to give your swear your loyalty to the one in power until he's in power, and then, uh, uh, or you become a threat to that that very authority. 
Yeah. So it's it's more about taking the territory because once you get the territory, you get all the resources that that territory has. That's exactly right. And and you can extract that and then use that for whatever uh, whatever it is that you want. But it's also about keeping that territory, right? Mm-hmm. Taking it mm-hmm. and, and keeping it are completely mm-hmm. different things. And you have to be qualified in both in order to survive in this type of structure, right? Yeah, um, strikes right. And I would, I would actually like to pause there really quick before we move on and talk about, um, you know, when when you're getting into a situation like this, of course, you just explained your background and, you know, what you believe God had actually called you to do, which is to create an atmosphere where miracles could follow. So mm-hmm. you're moving from a pastoral role into an academic one. Let's talk a little bit about the difference in how a ministry is run versus how a business is run and the the uh the the kind of crossing point right the the Mm -hmm. the inroad where these two met uh Mm -hmm. at at this institution that you were at and Mm -hmm. which one ruled (laughs) which one ruled over the other (laughs) (laughs) well that's a very good way to to, uh (laughs) to, to state that you know in a business i think uh uh the balance sheet, the bottom line, is is uh, what is going to kind of, as you would say, rule. Uh, so in, in an academic institution, uh, we had two leaders. One, one was over uh, enrollment, enrollment management. So he would bring in students. So if he wanted to secure his power and then have influence on w- with the board or, or the upper administration or the president, uh, he needed to show on a balance sheet how many students he he's bringing in and so that's his power well then on the other on the academic side if you're going to uh, have power in there you're going to you're, you're going to uh, show how you can run these these departments and the answers without any overhead how, how can you run it as lean as possible so get as many students in uh but also how lean can you run and so that that that, that, that was the the two competing forces uh, in the institution, but as far as a, a business, the bottom line is what gets you influence. And as you notice, if you can run an academic side, w- which is um, departments were prone to hiring too many people. You know, they need you always need more staff. You always need support staff. You always need more faculty and more uh, items. Well, uh, that that cuts into your. Uh, your your overhead and, and mess part of your overhead and it cuts into your profits and so they wanted to keep as many students coming in raise the enrollment while not hiring and and so that was that balancing act that they were trying to do um, and it's very difficult but you're not you're not driven in a ministry you're concerned about the heart of the individual God's restoration God breathed individuals that he's brought under your care and you are there to see them restored, renewed, and in revival uh, before the Lord. And, and so this, it, it, that, that is what you work for every day, is for God's interaction in the lives of, of, of his people, in humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, in a business, it's about that bottom line. How can you show that you can make more money with less? Mm-hmm. And then, th- and so that, and then, so if, if if you get too many staff, if say for instance, if you were to lose a certain amount of enrollment, uh, well, you just lay off people, or you stop assigning them, or you mm-hmm. fire them, or you. Uh, what I found is that you know they would just make up excuses, find ways to catch you, uh, set 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 you in parameter, give you a task that was uh, unable to be accomplished under the parameters. Uh, that they wanted, but when you weren't, when you did not accomplish it, well, then that's a mark against you, and then you could be fired. Yes, in the Bible, this is called bricks without straw, right? You're going to make <laughs> yes, the same amount of bricks. You're going to yeah, make yeah, more than exactly that, right. actually, but you're going to do it without straw. So yes, absolutely, and and I think that is so important to uh, understand as you're going through, you're you're uncovering not only this culture of fear, but actually their motivation. For mm-hmm. for why why they're even in existence, and it's really revealing to you what's in their heart about uh, about the mission, about the institution mm-hmm. itself, and 
really about what their goal is for survival in in this entire you know scheme of the whole world so to speak because you had an online component where you know you were reaching all across the the globe Mm -hmm. so as you're going about this you're uncovering you're you're aware now you're uh, you've um become enlightened to actually what's going on so how does this impact you and your department that you were in charge of you were the head of a department Yes, I was director of a department, so I was directing the online. So uh, I was always working very closely uh, to the dean of the the different deans uh, that came through. I worked with two different uh, deans, and but I, I was responsible. And but I always I never left my uh, pastoral uh, heart or training or my uh, you know all the, the spiritual warfare training and God's authority and how He sanctions and. Uh, so when you have an institution that is God breathed, that God gives the authority, uh, whether it be a business or a ministry or so forth, uh, I, I like to go back to that founding purpose. What did God say? What what is God holding this institution uh, to account for? And though I would go to God and and discuss with Him about about, about uh, how He felt about uh, how how it was being run, uh, and then also. Since I, I had legitimate authority, so a position as director in an institution, then that means I have a certain range of authority and, re- and responsibility to govern with integrity in the area of my jurisdiction. And so even though there were other areas uh, that were not being governed, what I would say, with godly intent, did not mean that I did not, was not responsible by God to govern my area and my jurisdiction with godly intent. And then so what would happen is we built a safe environment. I personally built a safe environment. So I, I took away the culture of fear, would not allow it to cross the threshold. I would have to go face to face with it and stop it directly in any individual that tried to bring that that culture of fear uh, or manipulation or control, I would stop them at the door and would not let them have influence. Uh, uh, in the area under my jurisdiction. And then what would happen is people all across the university would start, if they were uh, um, being moved out of their positions, they would they would naturally gravitate uh, to me uh, or to others in my department uh, for help. And uh, we ended up hiring a lot of those and having them transfer to our department because they understood that uh, we were there to protect and we were sovereignly working with God in this endeavor <laughs> to, to see his mission uh, accomplished in that yeah. school. And I imagine that was, you know, very challenging to kind of balance both trying to protect, you know, this influx of staff that was coming from other departments as well as run the actual school and teach sure. the actual classes and do all of that type of stuff and balancing what this what the overall uh, structure and leadership mm-hmm. of this organization wanted you to be doing and because you weren't doing you weren't towing the line you, now you, there was supernatural favor on you right because you were mm-hmm. increasing um, and and growing in every way but you weren't you weren't doing it the way they wanted you to grow right you weren't doing using their means and methods to grow yeah we we da- actually did not get on a lot of their radars until mm-hmm. we did grow and then they okay. saw yeah. that there, there was a, uh, an increase of the revenue to, to a place that, oh, well, i got to get my hand in that. And, uh-huh. and, uh, and so one of them tried to get hired, uh, moved uh, into our department. But to do that, he had to have another individual, uh, uh, actually my associate dean at that time, had, actually had to manipulate to have him fired. And so he began to plant this scheme all across the university uh, to have my uh, associate dean, uh, which was my direct report, uh, uh, fired. And well, uh, we prayed and we just, uh, so before that we were praying, said, God, you know, we've we've dedicated this department to you. We we have said that nothing, you will draw on a, a line of your spirit that would not allow any of this to happen. Well. We found out about this scheme because a friend of mine that also worked with me, a colleague, went to lunch, and when he sat down, they were having a meeting behind him in a booth 
and he could hear everything in the scheme. <laughs> and God exposed it, and the guy was sitting there boasting. And that's one thing about people that are arrogant or working with their own flesh. They have to boast about it. Yeah. And so he was boasting about well, how he was going to get in the school of government. And he was going to, you know, he just had to get this one person fired and then he'd get the rest of them fired. And, and then he'd bring in his team. And uh, we just went into prayer and God revealed it. Uh, the strategy um, re- revealed the, his workings, his intent. And we went into prayer and, and we stopped it uh, from happening. God gave us strategies of how to literally stop it from happening. Wow, that is really incredible. And exactly what you just said is, you know, I always tell my clients when they're dealing, typically they're dealing with a narcissist that they're either divorcing or there's they're separating from and there's children involved. They're about to go to court. And I always tell them, allow the narcissist to talk because they love the stage, they love the limelight, you know, and they can't help but tell on, on themselves because you get them talking and they're just going to start spewing out all of their plans. It, they just can't help it because they believe they're infallible. Mm-hmm. And, and Angel, whenever this gentleman, uh, when his plan, he knew he knew his plan was caught and he knew <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that we had his number, uh, he became enraged and he would use anger uh intimidation uh uh that he would come after us and then you could do and he would start looking for anything that we that that me or my team did that he could catch so he was trying to get us fired and one time uh he i sent an email and uh for this documentation and i just called him out that he was not gonna uh you know change a policy and within seconds, so I pressed send at my at my computer, and literally within seconds, my phone rang, and I put it on speakerphone, and that gentleman cussed me, uh, used every foul oh, language, wow. threat threatened me, uh, but I let I let the entire department hear it. I put it on speaker, put it on high, mm-hmm. uh, because, and now typically I don't get into a confrontation with some, because uh, that 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 is literally their favorite battleground. Yeah. You know, that that's where they're their best. Yes. And but now spiritual warfare they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And that's right. Uh, so I, I you know, fight you fight your battles. But so, there are times that you do have to go to the battlefield and you have to face the Goliath. You have there's yeah. no way around it. A thousand percent, uh, yes. Yeah. And when it is that time, you do expose them, right? Because like like uh, David went with Goliath, Goliath had all of his armor on, and you just expose that, hey, listen, this stone can get into the place that your armor does not go, and right. and it will take take that down that giant. There there absolutely is a time, and because the because narcissists typically will use. Um, they they will bank on the fact that their victim will not talk, will not speak out. They they'll just go along with the flow because because mm-hmm. they portrayed this very big and mighty presence and that they're too powerful. They're you know have too much money, have too much influence, have you know too much whatever in order to have somebody come and and go against them. And so mm-hmm. they will use that fear and intimidation to really shut down people's voices uh, mm-hmm. about what is going on. So you're exactly right. There has to come a time where you're where you're willing to say this far and no further and I'm I have no problem now sharing what you've been doing and exposing really what's going on in your heart. And you're exactly right. They don't understand the spiritual side of things. If you try to engage them in the natural, which is exactly what uh, Goliath was doing to David, trying to engage in a natural mm-hmm. battle, and he he didn't take that. And they used fear. So uh, if yes. you want to use Goliath, it, Goliath, if, if, if Goliath could have used fear and caused the king, whether it be Saul or so forth, to come and bow to him, see, yeah. they, then they would have won. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and then Israel would become a vassal state to, to, to the Philistines. And so this is the same way with a narcissist, whether it be in, in business or in a relationship. If you bow to them, then, it, then you, you, you become literally subjugated to them. And they'll mm-hmm. use intimidation yeah. and fear and yeah. threat. So I, I literally had this gentleman uh, threaten me. And then his anger was so visceral um, yes. that uh, that it, it could have become physical, and uh-huh. and then and, and they, they're, there's no there's no boundaries, there's no rules when it comes when you're dealing with an individual because yep. it's at their core of who they are. They will control, yes. and any person that will not bow to their control 
uh, and they, if they can't break you, uh, then they'll seek to destroy you. Absolutely. And I think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, the narcissist views themselves as the one who write all the rules and the laws. So they don't care about a bylaw. They don't care about the actual <laughs> legal law. They don't care about financial rules. They don't care if they have some sort of uh, certificate or there are some sort of license holder. They're fixing to break all of those ethical yep. and legal boundaries as well. They do not. Mm -hmm. This is that they are the the god of of mm -hmm. what the rule is, and you listen to them, and nothing else matters. Not even the legal, you know, United States yeah, government not. law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not even a restraining order. Uh, that's right. Know, not <laughs> even a restraining order. That's exactly yeah, you can, right. You can go get a temporary or, or a, yep. a permanent restraining order, but a narcissist that that they're the victim if that uh, is yes. what they feel. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and and I I I think it's really important for people who find themselves in that situation regardless of the structure you know regardless of if it's a marriage it's a business it doesn't matter that you understand that's that's par for the course this is how the narcissist is going to react that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still enforce your boundaries and use your god-given authority to to say no i'm not going to put up with that because this really is uh, a spiritual issue way way before it ever became manifested in the in the natural world yeah very much and mm -hmm. and I, i've in pa in pastoring i've had to deal with uh, numerous mm -hmm. situations where there was domestic violence and when you deal with someone that resorts to to violence mm -hmm. and i've been a part of uh, very uh, intense uh, situations uh, uh i mean as they were happening two and three in the morning you get the phone call and mm -hmm. this this man's about to you know, kill his spouse, and and then you're you're driving down the road, and some uh, and getting there just in time to see the power of God stop uh, a, a a tragedy. Hmm. Uh, uh, so that I've seen the miraculous hand of God save lives and stop uh, aggression, anger. But we also had to use the court system. We had to file for restraining orders. We had to. Uh, I've had to hide, hide people in uh, hotels to get them into a safe environment until the police could and would or would uh, actually take action. And sometimes that can be a very hard challenge to get the court system or a police officer or, or the legal system to actually look and say, okay, th this is happening. This is real. Typically, they only are there uh, after the event has transpired. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah. So um, I would encourage any person. You know, you, there 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 should be a legitimate way to address any form of abuse with, with within an institution uh, or within uh, the le uh, the legal system. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what I found at the the job I was working at is that the very avenues by which you were given to report abuse that they were the ones getting them reports of who was saying something. And then they would end up uh, uh, lining up all their power to have that individual discredited and fired. Yeah. And so, e e so even if you're trying to, trying to do best for the institution, you're actually uh, trying to show that there is an abusive structure being uh, manipulating people, destroying lives. And what would happen is, is if you did uh, uh, become a whistleblower or, or did say something against the administration, well, they would download that report, know exactly who you were and what you said. And then all of a sudden you have to bank on, well, am I going to go and work a nine to five job and collect my paycheck so I can maintain my mortgage, my school's, uh, my son's education, uh, my car note, my food. You know, it, it comes down to your personal survival at that point. Is it worth it? Or, or do I just keep my mouth shut, keep my head down, and just let it be what it'll be? And that, that, that was the challenge of individuals all across the institution. Yeah, and then they would not uh, address um, uh, the abuses that, that were happening because they understood that if you did that, they would blacklist you across the United States. You would oh, not wow. get a job anywhere. Wow. You would not get a job anywhere, e even if you left the institution. And we, there was, I have... Uh, numerous, uh, numerous, we're talking about over 10 individuals that left the institution and try to get jobs in other areas, one healthcare, uh, one in uh, medical. Uh, but if you try to get a job 
e- even in academia. So if you if you were a uh, high in position ac- in academia there and then left to try to get a new job, they would actually contact that other institution that was trying to hire you, blacklist you, and you could not get a job. And even if you went to another uh, area, they would use their influence to ensure that you were that you were blacklisted and would not find employment. Wow, that you know, this <laughs> so much of this is. Uh, exactly what I, what is frustrate, what I, what I run into with my clients ha- being so frustrated because it's like they are, they feel like no one is listening to them and they are right. They are right. They are, you know, it does not matter where they go. It's like the narcissist always still has this like reach mm-hmm. over them, which mm-hmm. is why I think it's so important to understand the spiritual battle of it because if you don't untangle yourself from it in the spirit, in the natural, there isn't a safe hiding spot for you to go or, or mm-hmm. another, you know, you, it's not as easy as just like, you know, leave the narcissist, right? Because the narcissist mm-hmm. is going to follow you wherever you go. Right. And so and some people would, would come to me and say, well, you're exaggerating. Why, why, uh-huh. why would an institution yep. come after a handful of people? Yeah. And, I, I, and I said, well, it sends a message to all the rest of them that might want to challenge mm-hmm. them or report abuse. And because if, if they say what, 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 what they, they would do against other individuals, well, they'll do it against me too. I'll keep my mouth shut. It, it, is, um, it is a challenge. But you, we do have to understand the spiritual uh, uh, way to deal with it. God does give us strategies. Yeah. And one aspect is the authority that he places upon an individual's life. With me, I, I always operated uh, with the authority that God gave me. He gave me a position, a director in a department, and as long as it came under my uh, uh, jurisdiction, or if I had influence with other leaders in other uh, departments, and then God would use me. Uh, and then through my influence with them, with their legitimate uh, uh, jurisdiction, I was able to begin to establish uh, 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 safe havens. And I went to one, uh, God gave me a dream, the same dream over three different nights. And each time it was a perspective from, it was given to me in the perspective of three different leaders at the institution. So it was the same dream, but but each night was from a different perspective of these three leaders. Then I went to one of those leaders. I walked into his office, and the moment I walked in, he said, he 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 just began. He backed up and he said, "The spirit of God is all over you. What has happened?" And I said, "Well, God gave me a dream," and I said, "And I hear I have a message for you." And then so I gave it to the first leader. Well, he picked up the phone and called the second leader. So I went to the second leader, and I said, in the same situation, that leader literally sat down in front of me and began to weep and cry. And, and I said, this is what God showed me. And then I went to the third leader, and I said, this is what God has shown me. And over the course of 12 years, that dream w- w- was fulfilled. Wow. I mean, that is amazing. And I, I think it's so important for people who are listening to understand that there's always an avenue of escape even if it feels like all the the roads are closed around you there really is an av- god will give you supernatural strategy he insight will. and uh, ability you know authority ability actual natural ability to go and and follow through with the instructions that he gives mm-hmm. when when you're talking about you know, that must have taken a lot of courage for you to go to those leaders, first of all, and a lot of, um, you know, getting over any kind of fear of backlash and, and so forth. I mean, you know, nobody wants to go discuss, you know, and it's hard for people to have a hard conversation anyhow, especially sure. when you know what the people are capable of or what 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 the organization is experiencing, right? The control that it's under and so forth. Um so in sure. your <laughs> yes, and so in your own, as you're going through all of this, what what are the methods or what are the means that you are using to take care of your emotional, your mental, your own spiritual health, so that you're in a place where you know when God does show you the the way out or give you a strategy or an insight on what to go do, that you're able to actually go follow through. Sure, I, at first. You know, you also have to really submit your heart and your will to the Lord, because if, if you're being hurt, 
Uh, you know, you could you could feel like, well, you know, I'm being a champion for the uh, for the week, and you uh, and then use aggression or use anger or so forth. You you have to you have to check your own heart. Where where am I coming from? Am I submitted to the Lord? Uh, what emotion is is driving me or empowering me to make these steps? Is God releasing me? Uh, to do this, do I have the authority uh, with, with the Lord and with and with the institution? Has He granted me the authority to actually address these particular items? And and so you, there there is divine order, e- e- even if uh, others don't don't play by the rules. That we we still have to operate uh, uh, in, as God sanctions, and because we need His authority, He He is the source. He His anointing and His power. And his authority is what gives us victory over the enemy and over man's plans. You know, the enemy has plans, but uh, so does man. And uh, we have to, so that I would do that. I would spend time in prayer. Um, I would uh, some. I, I would have conversations and prayer time with other leaders that felt that that were just as much impacted by this situation as I was, but yet people of integrity who, who they, who they themselves, uh, were having to address this. I mean, they were having to figure out how do they address it? How, uh, uh, you know, how, how, what, what is their obligation before God and the people that they are overseeing? What is their responsibility? And as leaders, we were struggling with that. I mean, sure. yeah. And, and, and so, so I would, I would work with those individuals and, and really submit myself to the Lord. I would never go rogue, uh, you know, and act on my own uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, temptations at times, maybe to mm-hmm. get angry until I didn't act out of anger. But one time I did go to my my direct supervisor, and I, and as I knew I was I was about to uh, make some statements that that could probably get me fired, and so I came so I came to him and I and I said I may I may be going going back to Louisiana today. <laughs> And he just laughed, and he said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I'm going to give you a gift, and it's called plausible deniability, <laughs> and I'm just going to do what I feel I have to do." Um, but I did have to address it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And during this time, your your wife was also experiencing the same situations because she worked at this institution as well with you. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really admire, which you were telling me before we started recording, is that you guys have a son, he's he's a teenager, and you did not, um, you included him in the process. And I think it's so important that at some point, of course, you have to shield your children, but when they are old enough that you do make them aware that hey people there there are manipulators out there there are users and abusers out there people will use the covering of this is a godly whatever you know for for their benefit people will uh uh continue this until you have a until you have a, a firm boundary of like no this is unacceptable and so the fact that you two were both going through this it included your son in the conversations around you know what to do what what's happening what potential n- next steps might be um the fact that you ended did end up well, I, I want you to explain how what was the final straw so to speak that you guys did end up leaving and uh moving back to louisiana where where you were originally from and including this with your son, how you guys manage this as a family unit and so forth, because this is ex- this is a very stressful situation for just one person to be under, let alone mm-hmm. both uh, both both he- you know people in the in the home, both adults mm-hmm. in the home to be experiencing literally on a daily basis. And so if you could sure. just share how that how you guys manage that, how you navigated that again as as you know, a couple, but also as a family, a parents to, to a teenager. Sure. And, uh, regardless of whether or not we would have spoken to him about it or shielded him from it, uh, there's actually no way to shield him from it. I mean, he, he would have been impacted either way, the stress, the atmosphere yeah. of the home, uh, you know, it, the, the challenges. I mean, he, he would have felt it, it would have influenced him, but he would not have had understanding. Yes. And so I, I, I sought to, and plus it's a training opportunity. If, 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 if God 
you know god gives us children but but we are but he he breathes and creates them he gives them their personality and their calling and so forth yes. i'm a steward over over, over my son yeah. uh, my son belongs to the lord that and i encourage his him and the lord to have that relationship for his calling and his destiny mm -hmm. um, but i'm a steward and and I wanted my son, number one, uh, you know, uh, your ministry deals a lot with uh, battling against that spirit of a, of a narcissist that operates. Well, I was dealing with a bully, just a just a playground bully at, at work. I mean, he was just he used the same tactics. It's and really I wanted good. my son and I wanted my son to see this is how you deal with the bully. If you ever back down. I mean, you, you'll have bullies at school, you'll have bullies in churches, you'll have bullies uh, on the street, you'll have them in jobs. And one day you're going to face a bully, and, and this is how you deal with it. Because if you ever give in to fear or you think that, that this is the convenient way out, it's not. It costs you so much to bow to a bully. And so I wanted my son to see how his father it, it was partnering with God and not giving in to fear and not allowing uh, uh, the the bully to just intimidate his way uh, through. But but no, you stand with God. You pray. You receive from God the authority to stand, and you stand. And 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 so and how to address it, and how you and and then he was able to see the battle as it unfolded, uh, but but also the victory, and how God gave total victory. And and so. Uh, to this day, uh, he will not back down uh, to a bully, and but he understands that it is also a spiritual battle first, and not a physical battle. Yeah, that's such a good lesson. And you know, I always tell my clients and my viewers on my YouTube channel is that you cannot prevent yourself from being a target of narcissistic abuse, but you can prevent <laughs> yourself from being a victim, right? And so right. I, I I feel like that's essentially the the message that you were trying to convey to your son mm -hmm. and really train him in how to deal with this because you're right this they're all around it's impossible for you to not run into them they're they're going to be there no matter if you know does not matter you're there. yeah mm -hmm. exactly does not matter how how it you does. build your life they're going to yeah, be you, around you can, you're going to come in contact with these individuals but mm -hmm. if you're able to recognize and discern them yeah. then then you can manage uh how close of a relationship that you have because this mm -hmm. this one bully he came out because he had an agenda to get to get that position mm -hmm. and so his the 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 bully aspect did not come out until he didn't get his way the way he wanted it when he wanted it <laughs> yeah. and at first though it was like let's go to dinner let's go yes. to vacations Yo, let's, yes uh, mm -hmm. you know let's spend weekends together let's get our families all linked together and blah 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 and well, so he was trying to, but the goal, his goal, it never was mm -hmm. about a true relationship. It, it, it was about getting his way the when he wanted it. And when, and when it didn't go that way, it went directly to violence, directly into yeah. confrontation. Oh, absolutely. Um, and slander as well. I'm imagining oh, yeah. I'm dealing with, I have a situation where that's exactly this. It's like, hey, you know, come over for this and I'd love to get together for that. And the second you call out, this is manipulation. Mm -hmm. You know, what I think is also really important for people to understand is that, you know, w dealing with a narcissist one time is one thing, but you do it again and you do it again and you just understand like that's it's no different than dealing with any other type of personality you know it's like okay well that's just how they are it has no impact on who I am or how I conduct my business or you know my life really you know it doesn't interfere with the thoughts that I think about or my daily routine and being able to to separate yourself and not get sucked into you don't have to show up for every fight that you're invited to by the narcissist you know and and really recognizing what's going to be important and what's not because a lot of times you know we were talking about earlier the narcissist will expose themselves but they'll also create the case for you you know you let them you let them just do what they're going to do they're going to create the case for you um it's a, and they build the narrative they sure they, do yeah yeah they build the narrative and and which justifies their actions it justifies their anger their abuse sure uh, yeah oh yes and and 
again, you let them do it long enough, you're going to have more than enough evidence because they don't even think about needing to conceal what they're doing because, again, in their mind, they've created the rules and those are the rules. And everybody better just play by those rules, regardless of the laws or, or, or so forth, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, and, you know, I tell, I tell, I tell my son, I, and we, I take him to coffee, you know, early, mm -hmm. and we would, we would discuss, uh, spend time, uh, um, you know, let's talk about your your, your resources, you know, because so at, at a, as a teenage, yes. as a teenager, he's th he's thinking, well, money's my only resource, and I said, mm -hmm. no, I said the first resource God gives you is time. That's right. And I said, I said that's your first. So how are you investing your time, and are you building yourself and so forth? And I, I said. You got also so if if you don't own anything, if you don't have any authority, no job, anything else. Do you know that that the first area that God gives you authority is your own mind? Yes. Uh, uh, J James three sixteen. Uh, oh, I say James three sixteen. Uh, uh, Second Timothy one seven. And we, you know, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. That word sound mind means self governance. Yeah. And so God actually, it's a gift from God that I can self govern right here, yeah. and. To break uh, and not to allow manipulation. If you, manipulation and control is about allowing external governance to dictate your internal state of being. So and, good. Uh, and then so, and I say, you cannot give up that ground. And I tell my son, you cannot give up that ground. You can't give it up to, to a bully, to manipulation, to intimidation. They always want the ground. And you know, so they only want that ground because it's valuable. Why is it valuable? Because it's sovereign ground God gave you. God told you, I will give you a sound mind. Sound, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he has secured your sound mind. And, and so I give, I give my son this. And then I talk to him about, you know, resources of time. Spend time learning who, who God says you are. Yeah. And then live in, the, li live in the present. You know, if you live in the past, you're, you're sacrificing your present. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're trying to live in the future uh, to control the outcome, then you're still sacrificing your present. How, how, how can I live in peace in the present to where God has given me peace of heart? And then, and then if somebody has had control over my mind or I did bow to intimidation and let, them, let that floodgate come in, how do I, how do I get that back? You know, how, how can I get that sovereign ground back? And, and th those, are those are things as a young man uh, he'll have to deal with, so we all deal with. That's really good advice, you know, regardless of the situation that you're going through and the age that you are. I love that you're training your son uh, up in this way, up in this way of thinking. And I, I couldn't agree more. You know, the first, uh, the very most valuable thing that you have after your salvation is your time. You don't know how much of it you have. I can always make more money. I can make more friends. I can make more everything else. I could never make more time. It's my most valuable resource. And learning how to steward the things that you have been given um, internally first, right? Your inner world will naturally come out in your outer world. And if you have order, if you have peace, if you have joy and harmony in your inner world first, your natural world must conform to that, must conform mm -hmm. to your inner world. Exactly. And so if you can learn how to govern your own self, your life, it doesn't matter what situation you're put in, you know, that thing is going to have to come into order because you're a person of order. Um, mm -hmm. And so I and think he, this, he, mm -hmm. he, he, even if someone it, it, so physically, I may be uh, I, someone may be able to to bind me, you know, uh -huh. restrain me, mm -hmm. confine me physically, but they could never confine mm -hmm. or restrain my heart yeah. and and my mind. And so, as long as my mind and my heart, that inner person, is free, then then be, before long, it will manifest in the in, in the physical as well. Yes, uh, a thousand yeah, percent. So, yeah. You know, Paul was in the basement in a jail, but in his mind, in his heart, he was free and he was worshiping and his jail cell physically open. I think that's such a good um, 
a, a good thing for people to keep in mind is that, you know, people can do whatever they want to, not saying that they should, but, you know, it is possible. Somebody could hurt your body, but only you could allow their words, their actions, any kind of thing, damage your soul, you know, damage your mind, damage your self-esteem, your identity, because that stuff was given to you by God, right? That and you and God are the only people who are, who are co-governing those things. And so, uh, I think it's really important. Uh, you know, one of the funny things actually that I say on my channel is I wish people could see themselves the way the narcissist sees them because you're so valuable, right? Then the yeah. thieves don't break into empty houses, right? And so likewise, mm. narcissists don't target people who don't have something valuable for them, whether it be exactly. that yeah, power, stature, uh, you know, wisdom, insight, connection, does not matter what it is that they're after. There is something that they see as valuable in you. And if you could just for one second see that kind of, you know, you see yourself in that light, it would be like, I'm not putting up with this anymore. You know, this right. isn't not God's best for me. And it would, I believe, endue people with such power that they would get out of that situation a lot quicker than, you know, going back and forth. Oh, am I this, this thing? Or it, did I do this thing? And, you know, letting the gaslighting just determine what their future is going to be. Yeah, it's a, such a challenge that we that we live in, especially relationships that are that close. That we have to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm, uh, right. You know, nar narcissists or bullies, uh, individuals that are that are just self absorbed. They they try to get to the most intimate areas, uh, in, the most intimate information and in areas of someone's life, so that they can harm and control. And it's a very dangerous thing. Uh, but you know, a, a free a free heart and a free mind that God gives us is a threat to any form of bondage. And when you see uh, autocratic governments, whether it be China, uh, whether it be uh, Russia, or so forth, uh, they can cage people. But the one thing they scare that they're most feared of that that, that is the, the most the, the extent of their power is to is to uh, uh, restrain, constrain life or take life. But they can never that they, they, they fear a free heart, a free mind, and uh, so any form of government, of governance, whether it be in a relationship or always uh, up to international relations. Uh, the, the autocrat or the controlling figure that has built a web of deceit uh, for their own benefit, they, 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 f they fear a free mind. They fear a free heart. And they will do whatever they can to control and break that. Absolutely. And, you, you know, on this channel, I've talked about this comes in many shapes, forms, sizes, all, all types of things. And being aware of what it feels like regardless of the body or the entity that it's coming through is so important because if you think it could only be happening in a situation where it's a husband and wife or you know it's a it's it's a parent to a child or whatever you'll miss the bigger influence that this spirit really has in society as a whole um so yes absolutely i couldn't agree with you more on that when when was it for you that you ultimately felt like or when was it that you had the the realization this this relationship between myself and this organization this university is is about to be done well uh god literally uh uh physically emotionally just began to release me and the team that i was partnered with at that institution and so uh, independently, uh, everyone began to find new jobs and God was, I mean, it was miraculous the way that these jobs and opportunities, uh, had come to different individuals across the institution and God began to just release people. And it wasn't just me. It, it was, it, it was, uh, it, uh, three, four, uh, within my department alone. And then throughout the university, it, it was, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It was many that, that God was releasing at one time. Uh, and so we all literally left the same time within the same uh, three three month window. Wow, that is a miraculous exodus, that's for sure. And so you leave that situation. What does what does ministry look like for you now? What is the difference between 
before having this experience because it's important to also for viewers i think to know to remember you were there for 12 years um years. and and so this was not you know just in and out you were there for a long time trying to uncover expose giving opportunities for the leadership to change their ways to repent to you know get back on track with the original mission um how how did this this process of 12 years change the way that you look at ministry, the way that you physically do or operate in ministry? Um, and what, and how is that coming across now in, in what you do now? Well, uh, one aspect, uh, it, it was very, very challenging. It does, uh, the daily warfare uh, can physically, mentally, uh, emotionally just break you down. And so, when we're sitting here today doing this podcast, uh, you know, we feel good. You know, we've had our coffee and breakfast. You know, it's uh, you, you feel good. We're, we're not in a battle. Uh, but when you're in a battle and it, and it, and it, uh, it it's an extended ba- battle, it's a, like a war of attrition, uh, <laughs> then you begin to wear down. Uh, the physical body uh, begins to uh, deplete in certain vitamins and minerals. Uh, your chemicals uh, in your brain uh, and in your body can literally begin to get into imbalance. Uh, uh, your diet can change because either you're not hungry or, or, or eating too much. People, you know, there's uh, different ways that, that it affects us. For me, I just won't eat. Uh, but you get, you live stress begins to pres- uh, uh, present challenges to the physical body and then the emotional uh, you become fatigued and so through that it, it is, is truly 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 uh, uh, a challenge that we go through so it gave me uh, a better understanding that during warfare times of warfare especially extended warfare that individuals must take a, just as much of a priority for their physical health uh, and their physical makeup. So it, uh, I recommend uh, of going to a doctor and actually having blood blood work done, get a yes. health checkup. A hundred percent. Blood work is the number one thing that mm-hmm. I recommend as well, because you need to know exactly what's going on with your specific body.